Good morning, everyone. Oh dear Lord, yes you're one of a kind And do you cross, we leave our past behind My sweet Lord, no one compares with you We bow in awe that you are God and man And for you the world began Yet you came to save from our sins, oh dear Lord, yes you're one of a kind, and through your cross, give us peace of mind, my sweet Lord, you're holy and you are true, and through your death, God's love has been revealed. came not to be served, but to serve. Oh dear Lord, yes you're one of a kind, we join you, and now our lives are defined. My sweet Lord, we bow down and worship you. You're the mighty God, and the Prince of Peace, and your reign She'll never cease Every knee shall bow Every tongue shall praise You, Lord, you're so one of a kind You're our Savior And all of mankind My sweet Lord We lift up this song for you Oh, dear Lord you're one of a kind And do you cross We leave our past behind My sweet Lord No one compares with you Oh dear Lord Yes you're one of a kind And do you cross You give us peace of mind My sweet Lord You're holy and you are true We Lord, we bow down and worship you. Oh, dear Lord, yes, you want of a cat, you're our Savior, and all of mankind. My sweet Lord, we lift up this song for you. Yes, we lift up this song for you. Yes, we lift up this song. You. Do one more for you. you're down and your heart is in despair and it seems your life is always filled with care there is hope for your weary soul today and the place of rest you find is at the cross look to the cross oh when you're feeling low look to the cross oh that's the way to go for the father gave his son to set us free yes we'll find the love of god 
at Calvary And if you're lost And you cannot find your way And you struggle just to make it To your day There is hope And this peace of mind for you And the place of peace you find is at the cross Look to the cross Oh, when you're feeling low Look to the cross Oh, that's the place to go For the Father gave His Son To set us free Yes, we'll find the love of God At Calvary there's no one he can love Yes, he'll love you as you are So surrender at the cross And worship your King And look to the cross Oh, when you're feeling Look to the cross Oh, that's the place to go For the Father gave His Son To set us free Yes, we'll find the love of God At Calvary Yes, we'll find the love of God At Calvary Yes, we'll Find the love of God at Calvary. Yes, we'll find the love of God at Calvary. I'll hang up the guitar right back. Okay, good morning again to all of you. Could you turn your Bibles to, let's see, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. And the, we're continuing our series on the uh, the doctrine of past the teacher. And this is a, let's see, it's a tw I believe it's a 22-hour series I got it at. And I, I know I mentioned it before. Yeah, it's 22 hours. So, um, so that's what we'll be uh, continuing today. We'll be looking at our 16th hour in this 22-hour series. On the past, the teaching today, as you can see on the board, will be noting the uh, uh, First Timothy five seventeen and eighteen, which which deals with the financial support of pastors. So uh, this is, uh, and then we'll be going on to uh, church discipline and, and the pastor that later on the, and two, on Tuesday and Thursday classes. We'll be uh, be on that quite a bit, and then uh, a little for a little bit, and then we'll be uh, finishing it off with answering the question: Can a woman be a pastor? So. Uh, this is uh, what we got coming after today's class, and uh, so we're we're resuming our our normal schedule. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with our ministry, um, I do this from time to time on our uh, Saturday classes. But uh, my name is Bill Wentz. I'm a pastor ordained in 1998 from Dr. Uh, Grace Bible Church in Somerset, Massachusetts, and uh, I started uh, uh, my first of two church plants in, uh, in the Cedar Rapids, Iowa area in 2001, just before 911, August of 2001. I was there at the first church plant to 2010 of August, and then I started a second church plant, left that first one, and started a second one in Marion, Iowa, which is adjacent to Cedar Rapids. The other first church plant was in Norway, Iowa. 
And uh, so I was there to the, in Marion, Iowa, which was basically a house church. And, uh, and but uh, we had uh, broadcasted all our classes live through, throughout the internet on the internet, and we had a uh, our, our internet presence exploded really during that period. And uh, so then uh, I left there in 2019 of um, uh, June of 2019, come back to Massachusetts, Norwood, Massachusetts, where I grew up to help my father and my mother. My mother has dementia, so I spent, uh, while she was in the house, I spent those last two years she was in the house helping my dad with her. And uh, she's uh, now in a nursing home. And uh, and so uh, so about a year after I had um, left, uh, you know, uh, she went to the nursing home. I was, during that whole time, I was broadcasting live uh, through uh, with Western Bible Ministries. I didn't have a, a congregation in front of me. And uh, but I was invited to speak on different a couple of churches uh, during that period of time, but uh, so then a, another church in uh, Huntsville, Alabama that I knew of through a mutual friend of ours that, that this church, Doctor Bible Church, Huntsville, Alabama, uh, mutual friend brought us together. We knew about each other for about six, seven years. I knew about them. They knew about me. So uh, their pastor, Pastor Peak, uh, re- uh, retired recently. So uh, and I took over. I accepted the job back in May this past year. And uh, 2022 now we're in 2023, and then I, I came down here and started my and uh, in, in just before Fourth of July I moved in here in Huntsville, Alabama, about a half mile from the church. Uh, so um, so I teach three times a week with Winchester Bible Ministries and twice a week uh, for Doctrinal Bible Church. As you can see on the board, uh, I teach on Saturday, Tuesday, and Thursday mornings at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Huntsville, Alabama is on Central Time. And uh, so I, that's what I do for Winston Bible Ministries, and and then also Doctrinal Bible Church. I teach on six thir- at six thirty p.m. Central Standard Time at Doctrinal Bible Church, and they're located at twelve fifteen Russell Street Northeast in Huntsville, Alabama. Twelve fifteen Russell Street North uh, Northeast in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, so if you're ever in the area, come on down. And uh, so um, I'm, my uh, my house is uh, I have a cottage, and uh, so I. I broadcast here once from Bible Ministries in this uh, office I have, and uh, and then you know on, on Wednesday evenings at six thirty p.m. I teach at Doctrinal Bible Church, and also Sunday mornings at nine thirty. Um, I t- teach at nine thirty. Hold on one second. I just want to change something here on my screen here before I go any further. Okay, all right, good. Because I can see my. I'm looking over here a lot of times because I'm looking my. Um, I change things up, so I'm just looking at. Uh, before the Christmas break, so I just changed and making sure my sounds going. Anyways, so I, uh, which it is, so uh, uh, I, uh, on Sunday mornings at 9:30 a.m., uh, I teach at Doctrinal Bible Church, and so I do two sessions, and, and we have a break in between, um, so two about an hour long sessions on, on Sunday. So I start, we start at 9:30. Um, we uh, sing a hymn at the beginning of both sessions, and uh, and then I do I do uh, Bert uh, Peak, who's the head deacon there, he does that and does a great job, and I sing a song at the end of service. We teach we have the Lord's we observe the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of each month there, and also with Wedge Bond Ministries as we're going to do today, we're going to be um, we're, uh, because we missed the uh, because we didn't have service on January first, which was the first Sunday of January, we're observing the Lord's Supper today. And uh, for Winston Bible Ministries, and tomorrow with uh, Doctor of Bible Church, and so uh, um, so that's so, so I'm teaching five times a week, and uh, which is it's worked out great. Good, it, 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 I'm not too, I don't feel overwhelmed at all. But uh, so it's in both. Of course, I'm an, uh, it's an expository ministry, Winston Bible Ministries, and Doctor of Bible Church (DBC) is the acronym we use. And uh, so I, that means we go through the different books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by cra- paragraph, book by book. I try to alternate between Old Testament and New Testament. I sometimes deviate from that. Like after we we, we finished uh, for Winston Bible Ministries, Jude, and uh, I, uh, and now we're doing a, 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 doctor, a pastor teacher in between books. We like to do different subjects in between books here at Winston Bible Ministries. And I'm, then I'm gonna, the next book I'm going to do for Winston Bible Ministries is the Ephesians. Usually I go to the Old Testament after doing a New Testament book like Jude, but uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna, uh, but I'll make it up with the after we finish Ephesians. I'll do a couple Old Testament books. But Doctrinal Bible Church, we teach the various doctrines of the Christian faith like we do here at Winston Bible Ministries in between books. But at Doctrinal Bible Church, I do it on Wednesdays. So we finished off the Trinity. We're in the middle of Canonicity, or we're we're coming to the end of, of the Doctrine of Canonicity. And for on Sundays, I do 
the different books of the Bible for DVC. So uh, we finished off Jude, and now we've, we've already started a new book, Obadiah. So we'll be continue, uh, beginning in the verse-by-verse verse study of that book starting tomorrow at Dr. Revival Church. So um, so that, uh, just that's kind of in all of our classes, I recorded video and audio for Western Bible Ministries. Only the audio is recorded for uh, Dr. Bible Church. And uh, our website is www.wenstrom.org. We also have a Faith Life Sermons website, which you can access through the homepage of Wenstrom Bible Ministries. There's a link there. Also, we have podcasts on Amazon Music, um, Spotify, Amazon Music, and uh, iTunes. Just search for us under Wenstrom Bible Ministries. The links, uh, you can, um, there's a link to those uh, different podcasts. For instance, uh, the recordings for DBC, I put on our uh, Faith Life Sermons website, the audio there, and also you'll see it says um, Huntsville, uh, Doctrinal Bible Church, Huntsville, Alabama. Those are the classes that I'm doing at DBC. And also the podcasts are like that too. So if you're searching for you'll see that with the podcast. Um, so um, just so you get, so you understand where the Doctrinal Bible Church recordings are going. So we have yet to do, we haven't done a video yet, so keep that in prayer. We, we basically go by the, you know, if God doesn't raise somebody up to do the, you know, this, the, these the certain things, like they don't have a website, they have a domain there, but, uh, you know, we kind of, like I've always adhered to is God will raise up the people if he wants somebody to do the website or and somebody to do uh, the video or whatever. Um, so we'll keep that in prayer. And uh, so, uh, and I also I have, oh, let's see, so all the, rec- the MP3, MP4 recordings up to 2019, August of two, uh, June of 2019, we're on our Wednesday.org site. From that, uh, starting in August 2019, all our MP3 MP4 record, MP4 recordings, MP3 MP4, are up on our Faith Thy Sermons website, which again you can access. There's a link on our homepage at Western Bible Ministries to that site, or just Google me. And also, we have over 1,700 written articles in PDF format on the Wednesday.org site. Everything I've ever published, written, is there. Over 700 articles on our Academia Edu website, which is doing very, very well. So Google me, you'll see that particular website. I'll probably put a link up to that site one, one of these days. Um, and what else? Um, I write my own Christian music. Um, some, several people have, at Doctoral Bible Church have asked me how many songs I've written. I, I have no idea. It's, I've started writing songs when, as soon as I started playing guitar at 16. And the Christian stuff I started writing when I was in my, uh, around 24, 23. And so um, I, I don't know, definitely well over 300 songs. If you put everything I've ever done, I have no, it's probably over 500 songs. I have no, I, I got a lot of stuff recorded, stuff I've lost, I, they're gone, I don't have the recordings anymore. Somebody else has my recordings, I think, on some of these stuff, some of these things. So so I don't know, it's definitely well, everything I've ever written, probably over 500 songs with a, myself or collaborating with other people. So anyways, that's, uh, so that's, uh, so uh, you, you can see we have a YouTube page, and uh, just Google me, and you'll see, or you'll see the little logo for you, uh, for you uh, logo for YouTube at the bottom of our Wenstrom.org page. Or just Google me, you'll see Bill Wenstrom, and we have playlists for everything we've done since 2011, since we've been on uh, YouTube. And also, I record all my music on playlists there as well. And also on the Wenstrom.org site, there's the video and the and the the, the, uh, the audio. And uh, I think the lyrics of uh, the songs I've written over the, of the years. So I like to do a collection of 14 songs when I write a new set batch of songs. So I've just started a new collection of songs. The song I wrote for in dedication to my my brother Kenny, who passed away back in November. So uh, that'll be the that was the first of uh, several songs I'm going to start doing. I'll do another collection of 14 songs and record and put them on YouTube and also our Wednesday.org page. So, uh, let's see, uh, anything else? If you'd like to support Western Bible Ministries, uh, you can go through the website with PayPal. Uh, or some people send us checks. Uh, you can, the mailing address for Western Bible Ministries, is, as you see on the board, is, is 603 uh, uh, O'Shaughnessy Avenue, Northeast Huntsville, Alabama. 35801 is the zip code. O'Shaughnessy is spelled O-S-H-A-U-G-H-N-E-S-S-Y, Avenue Northeast. Uh, O'Shaughnessy, there's no um, apostrophe between the O and the S and no capital S. So it'll still get there even if you do it like, you write it like an Irish guy's last name would be. I don't know where they get this guy. <laughs> the street they named it after. And uh, also, uh, you rate that check out to Wenstrom Bible Ministries. It's tax deductible. 
And uh, so, uh, again, um, uh, good to have you all with us. And we had a little Christmas break, as we usually do. And so we're resuming our classes, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, teach, finishing off this uh, series on Pass the Teacher and then doing Ephesians here with Winston Bible Ministries. So, so let's, uh, we're gonna, again, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. So after the lesson today, we'll be observing the communion elements. So if you have bread and juice in front of you, that'd be great. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll observe the communion elements after this lesson and then close with, us, uh, close with that. And then uh, we'll f- finish off with a closing prayer and we'll be all set. So let's, uh, let's take a moment of silent prayer as is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we're in fellowship with God because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. We maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's, any, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing and distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us another day to study your word. We thank you for everyone joining us, whether it's live or through the recordings. I just thank you, Father, for the technology. People take advantage of it, and I pray everything would function properly with no rec- problems with the recordings, the video, and the audio. And also, and upload these things to our various websites and podcasts and media platforms that you've given to us. I pray you protect them and, and, uh, and use them mightily. And I also pray there'll be no problems with the streaming video provided by YouTube. I thank you for the service that they provided. I they pray it would, uh, it would function properly as it has many, many times since we've been doing this with it. And uh, thank you for the technology. And um, also thank you again for those who are joining us live or through the recordings <clears throat> at a later date. I just pray, Father, that through the Spirit, those in the audience that are your children would be able to understand what's being taught, make application, to be humble and sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. Uh, Please break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening. And I just pray, Father, that uh, people would take these things to heart and also help me to be uh, sensitive and humble in the presence of the Holy Spirit, following His guidance and direction. By the power of spirit, I pray you would help me to communicate this uh, subject today with regards to the financial support of pastors. Help me to do so also with reverence, respect, and power and to uh, and so that your people can receive the necessary spiritual nourishment. And I pray as a, pray as a result of applying these things that we're being, being taught here, that uh, you and your son, Jesus Christ, will be glorified. And uh, so we uh, also... We just, again, thank you for, I thank you for the gift that you give me and the technology, again, the people joining me that are supporting this ministry, Western Bible Ministries over the years with their time, talent, and treasure and truth, and uh, praying for this ministry. I just thank you for each and every one of them, and I pray you would raise up more people uh, with positive volition to the Word of God in this ministry. So, Father, we pray for the service in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. All right, if you haven't turned there already, please go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. We'll get there momentarily. Uh, we're again continuing this uh, a series on uh, the pastor teacher. And if you look on the board, uh, I have an outline for this particular doctrine. Uh, we noted in our first hour of this uh, study the introduction to the, uh, the book, which is basically um, touches upon everything we're going to cover in this series on the pastor teacher. Then we noted the different terms of the past, the teacher in the Greek New Testament in our second hour. And then we noted in the third hour, the spiritual gift, the past, the teacher. And we went to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And, when we, and we pointed out in that passage uh, that uh, the, um, the Granville Sharp rule is not in effect with the two words, one, the word for shepherd, poimain, uh, pastor, poimain, and uh, teacher, didaskalus. Both are in the accusative case and the nominative plural, or the accusative plural, and the Grangeville Sharp rule is not used with plural nouns. But uh, we did find out that there's, we did point out that uh, with the apostles, uh, prophets, and evangelists, and uh, before uh, pastors, the poimen, there's a definite article, but no definite article before teachers, didaskalus. 
And we pointed out that that's significant, though the Granville shot rope was not in effect, it's still significant. Uh, and it, it, what it indicates is that uh, teachers is a subset of pastors. And as we pointed out in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and also Romans 12, 8, there's the gift of uh, leadership that I pointed out in our series on Romans and past and spiritual gifts. But um, the, uh, the those who have the gift of leadership and also uh, those who have the gift of teaching fall into the category of not only pastors, but also elders as well. So the, those who have the gift of leadership, that's mentioned in Romans 12, 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, uh, they are, fall into the category of a pastor and also an elder, as well as those who have the gift of teaching. And so uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, uh, Paul doesn't mention the gift of leadership, and neither does he, he doesn't do that either in Ephesians 4, 11, because in both passages, uh, he is, uh, well, he does mention the gift of administrations, which is leadership in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, but he doesn't mention it in, in, uh, in, uh, along with uh, uh, those who have the gift of teaching. In the Ephesians passage, he's emphasizing the communication of the Word of God that, that builds up and edifies the body of Christ. So the gift of leadership doesn't do that. Uh, and, uh, and so that's why he doesn't include um, the gift of leadership in that passage in Ephesians 4.11. So then we noted the, the qualifications for the pastor. Uh, we spent a quite a long time on uh, probably about four or five classes on 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 and Titus 1, 6 through 9, which actually uh, give us the qualifications. And we so we noted that there were, there were some, uh, uh, those who, uh, uh, some of the qualifications that Paul mentions in 1 Timothy 3, he mentions also in Titus. So if we take away the duplicates, uh, there's 25 of these qualifications, which are basically, as we pointed out, marks of maturity. And so in other words, for the man who has the gift of teaching to assume the office of overseer, he must manifest these characteristics over an indefinite period of time. There's no time limit on, on, on when he should assume the office of overseer. Uh, it's uh, the Holy Spirit will make the congregation and the pastor who's head over this man with the gift to pass the teacher. It'll uh, they'll he'll they'll identify the gift and uh, if he and then. When God's ready, he'll allow him to become the overseer, is uh, the pastor of his own church, in other words. So then we noted the threefold purpose of the pastor, uh, the gift, man with the gift of teaching, which is uh, found in first, uh, Ephesians 4, tw uh, 12. And, uh, and then we see the, we started, we noted the fourfold responsibility of the pastor teacher. So we noted that the fourfold responsibility of the pastor teacher is to study, teach, pray, and exemplify godliness. So we noted those, each one of those in detail. So you're supposed to pray for your congregation. You're supposed to feed your congregation the word of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you can't do that if you don't study. So you have to be, uh, your responsibility is to study. Then you can teach because you can't teach what you don't know. You're to pray for your congregation. You're supposed to also uh, apply the word of God and model it uh, for your congregation. And of course, no one does that perfectly as a pastor, but it, this should be a, a lifestyle uh, that he does this. This should be the whole tenor of his life is one of study, teach, praying, and exemplifying godliness. And then today we'll be noting the financial support of the pastor in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. And then we'll round out this study of the doctrine of the pastor teacher by noting church discipline in the pastor. Very, very important. And uh, how many pastors do you know teach on the doctrine of church discipline in relation to the pastor teacher? I bet you don't have many pastors that do that. I'm doing it because it's in the word of God. And I know a lot of guys will avoid it because they don't want to be held accountable for the things that they're doing, which they shouldn't be doing probably. So I don't know. I know a few pastors that are, have done, wouldn't teach this subject in a million years because of they were living double lives. Then the final hour will be noting, uh, answering the question, can a woman be a pastor. So we'll be going to that passage in First Timothy, uh, chapter was it twelve? Uh, chapter two, verses uh, twelve through uh, fourteen. We'll be looking at that in detail. And of course, we did First Timothy in 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 in, in detail. Second Timothy, Titus. We did all those books at when I was at uh, Webster Bible Ministries was in Marion, Iowa, and uh, I taught each of those books, the pastoral epistles. So if you want to know it in these uh, those books in great detail. They're recorded and uh, video and audio on our website at winston.org and also the, the exegesis and exposition 
of each of those books in exhaustive detail is found on that website as well. Also on our Academia EDU website as well in PDF format. So that's uh, that's uh, what we're going to be doing today and it's what we've done in the past. Now with this series of past to teach you what we're going to do in the future and of course again what we're going to do today. So uh, you should be at uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2. Uh, look at verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17. I'm going to read all the way uh, to um, the end of the chapter, and then I'm going to read my translation of those exact same verses. So it's 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 24, uh, 25, and then we'll look at uh, that sa- these same verses in my translation. So 1 Timothy 5, 17. I'm reading from the Net Bible. I read from all the modern translations. I like the Net Bible. Um, I like it for its notes, its translation, also the NIV as well. It's very, I use that at DBC and ESV is great. There's, there's a whole, but Lexham Bible is great. There's a whole bunch of them, but uh, I like them all. So first Timothy 5, 17 says in the net Bible elders uh, who provide effective leadership and those who are again, elders are those who have the gift of leadership mentioned in Romans 12, 8, first Corinthians 12, 28, and also those who have the gift of teaching. So elders who provide effective leadership must be counted worthy of double honor. As we'll see, that's re- related to the remuneration of the elders especially those who work hard in speaking and teaching. And that would be what we're talking about, what I, the gift I have. So um, the gift of teaching, he says, especially them, because they're the ones that provide the spiritual nourishment to the body of Christ, not the gift of leadership, not that exercise of that gift. And then uh, Paul gives the reason for this. For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. And he then he says, quoting the Lord Jesus himself as well, he quoted the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 25, 4, with that the first quote, but in the second quote, he's actually quoting from Jesus and a quote that's found in the Gospels, as we'll see. So it says, and then he says in verse 19, talking about uh, church discipline in relation to the pastor and the elders and the, the gift of leadership and the gift of, uh, gift of teaching, do not accept an accusation against an elder unless it can, can be f- confirmed by two or three witnesses. Those guilty of sin must be rebuked before all as a warning to the rest. Before God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels, I solemnly charge you to carry out these commands without prejudice, Timothy, or favoritism in any, of any kind. So you're not to speak, uh, keep, treat the pastor uh, any different than anybody else in the congregation. He's subject to church discipline just like anybody else. You don't play fr- favorites. And then it says in verse 22, he says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. That means don't ordain anybody before they're ready. And he tells you why. And he says, so do not lay your hands on anyone hastily and so identify with the sins of others or be complicit in those their sins because you ordain them too soon. Keep yourself pure. Verse 23, stop drinking just water, but use a little wine for your digestion and your frequent illnesses. And that's addressed to Timothy. Timothy, of course, it's a parenthetical remark. Then he says the sins of some people, some pastors, he's saying, are obvious going before them into judgment, but for others, they show up later. Similarly, good works are also obvious and the ones that are not cannot remain hidden. And let me give you my translation now of those exact same verses. Those elders who are leading correctly must be considered worthy of double honor. We'll talk about what that means again today. Specifically, those who make it the habit of working hard with respect to the word. Yes, teaching the word. Because the scripture says you must absolutely never muzzle an ox while it does at any time tread out the grain. Also, the worker is as an eternal spiritual truth worthy, namely, of his pay. Continue making it your habit of not receiving an accusation against any elder except, however, on the basis of two or three witnesses. Verse 20, you must continue to rebuke in the presence of everyone, those who continue as a lifestyle sinning in order that the rest will also be in a state of fear. I myself solemnly charge you in the presence of God the Father as well as Christ who is Jesus, and in addition the elect angels, that you carry out these things without prejudice, uh, prejudging, continue making it your habit of, of doing absolutely nothing on the basis of partiality. You must continue to make it your habit of laying hands on no man hastily, thus not being complicit in others' sins. You must continue making it your habit of keeping yourself pure. Stop drinking water exclusively, but rather for your own benefit, begin to make your use of your small quantity of wine and continue doing so because of your stomach as well as your frequent illnesses. And then in verses 24 and 25, he says, the sins committed by some men, some pastors, are conspicuous with the result that they, as an eternal spiritual truth, lead to discipline. However, indeed, for the detriment of some, 
they as an eternal spiritual truth show up later. Similarly, the excellent works produced by some men are conspicuous. Also, those which are otherwise will absolutely never, as a certainty, remain hidden. So, as we uh, we see, we're going to be looking at the financial support of pastors, and in particular, verses 17 and 18 of 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, what's interesting about 1 Timothy chapter 5, in this chapter, Paul addresses Timothy's proper conduct in relation to various groups in the Ephesian Christian community. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, he instructs his young delegate, Timothy, as to how to conduct himself with regards to both older and younger men, and in addition, his proper conduct with respect to older and younger women. He then follows this up, Paul does, with instructions to Timothy as to the proper treatment of widows in the church in verses 3 through 16. And then in 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 through 25, Paul instructs Timothy as to the proper treatment of elders. And of course, elders, there are two uh, groups under, uh, two gifts under that, the term elders and as, as well as um, pastors, the gift of leadership, as I pointed out, and the gift of teaching. Now, in 1 Timothy 5.17, as we just read in my translation and the Net Bible, Paul issues Timothy a command and to the Ephesian Christian community ultimately. ultimately. And uh, so again, Paul in 1 Timothy 5.17, he issues a command to the Ephesian Christian community through his young delegate Timothy and uh, fellow pastor for that matter. In this verse, as we read, he commands that the elders who lead correctly are worthy of double honor especially those who work hard at teaching. So as it says in my translation of 1 Timothy 5.17, those elders who are leading correctly must be considered worthy of double honor, and that's talking about remuneration for their services, specifically those who make it their habit of working hard with respect to the word, yes, teaching the word. So working hard with regards to the word of God, I've been talking about this a lot, and I've, uh, I've, pointed out there are many pastors, and this is true throughout the church's history, but there are many guys, who, who are pastor teachers, that are not doing their job. They don't work hard at, at teaching the Word of God. And to te- work hard at teaching the Word of God, teaching on a Sunday for 20 minutes or 10 minutes is not working hard. I mean, how much preparation does that take? And if you're, you're inundated with doing other things and can't do that, you're missing the whole point of God giving you your gift. If you have the gift of teaching, you need to teach as often as you can. In fact, there's no excuse now with the internet. You can teach as much as you want. You know, even if there's nobody directly in front of you, you can still broadcast and somebody's going to listen to you, especially in other parts of the world. I mean, if Americans, Christian American Christians are very spoiled and uh, they have a great uh, uh, advantage over most people uh, in the world today that are Christians. And in fact, throughout over most Christians in the past, uh, because of the technology and the great Bible programs, and we're benefiting from 2,000 years of great Christian scholarship. And uh, a lot of Christians in America don't take advantage of that. And a lot of pastors are not teaching the Word of God, and they're not working hard at teaching the Word of God. And so uh, the pastor is to study, teach, pray, and exemplify godliness. If he's doing other things that are keeping him from doing those thing, four things, he's not going to be able to be working hard. So if they're going to be working hard in the Word of God, you got to study you got to know your subject. you got to teach these different books of the Bible, not just topical studies. Uh, I do topical studies at, between books at Winston Bible Ministries and on Wednesday evenings at DBC. Um, so I go through the various Christian doctrines, the Christian doctrines of the Christian faith, the Trinity, justification, sanctification, salvation, um, the rapture, the Day of the Lord series, prayer, forgiveness, you name it. I've done it. You can look it on the website, okay? And then I do these different books of the Bible. A lot of so-called doctrinal pastors out there who call themselves doctrinal, they're not even teaching these books. And uh, the men that they, the men they get, many of these uh, men were ordained by men who actually were faithful teaching these books. I've done Genesis, I've done Exodus, I've done Romans, over 500 hours in Romans. Uh, Colossians, uh, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. Uh, I've done the book of Daniel. I've done uh, Zephaniah, Obadiah, Haggai, Habakkuk. Jonah. Uh, and so these, all these books are there. We're, we're supposed to teach those books. So, uh, and I would say, why aren't these books being taught by pastors? Why am I seeing not, if you go to their websites or pop into their services, they're not teaching these books. No wonder the Christians are not, uh, the Christian influence in America is, is waning because 
The word of God is alive and powerful. The, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. No wonder we're not making an impact because we're rejecting the gospel, i.e. Bible doctrine, sound doctrine. And we're supposed to start the lead. The pastors are supposed to be working hard and, and teaching the word of God, as it says in 1 Timothy 5.17. So uh, in 1 Timothy 5.17, as you can see on the board, the word elders is presbuteros in the uh, Greek. And it refers here to those who hold the office of overseer, which could only be held by those men with the spiritual gift to pass the teacher and also uh, those with the gift of leadership. And uh, and so, but the the, the teacher, the man with the, who's a pastor teacher, uh, he must uh, uh, met the qualifications that Paul presents to us in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, which we went over in detail. Many of those are found in Titus chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. So the uh, elder here in context, because he's talking about teaching, is referring to those men who have the, office of overseer, which could only be held by those men with a spiritual gift to pass the teacher that had met the qualifications listed by Paul again in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Now the word leading there is the verb proistomy, and this word is used with reference to the pastor's authority over the Ephesian Christian community, which he exercises by teaching them. And uh, so if the minute the pastor stops teaching the word of God, uh, he's outside of his authority. He's not he's the whole the word. Holy Spirit's not going to bless his work. Uh, you, your authority is from the Word of God. So every your policies, everything that your ministry does must be based upon supported by the teaching of the Word of God. So the minute the pastor goes outside the Word of God and starts talking politics or some social activism that's not biblically supported, he's not really exercising the authority that God delegated to him to benefit the body of Christ, by the way, which leads to this next point about this verb pro me leading. This word conveys a leadership style that's characterized by loving care. It exp- in other words, it expresses the idea that the Ephesian Christian community uh, submits to the leadership of the pastor teacher out of respect for his position of teaching the word and the delegation of this authority by the Lord to him and not out of fear. So it's a word conveys the idea of a, 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 a leadership style that's characterized by loving care. You must love your people. And remember, you know, if you love your people, you'll feed them the word of God. Jesus said, if you love me, Peter, you'll feed my lambs, right? In John 21. Well, if that's what a pastor demonstrates his love for the Lord by feeding the body of Christ. He shows his love for the body of Christ by feeding them the word of God because that manifests his love for the Lord by doing that. Now the word correctly there, if you look at my translation again on the board, it says uh, those elders who are leading correctly must be considered worthy of double honor. The word correctly there is kalos. It can, in the Greek, it conveys the idea that the overseer or pastor teacher is governing the household of God according to the standards of God's word. And specifically with regards to teaching the word of God, to the household of God and operating in God's love by the power of the Spirit. And when it said, Paul says uh, that the elder must, uh, in, in my translation again, those elders who are leading correctly must be considered worthy of double honor. That phrase must be considered worthy of double honor. That expresses a general precept that the Ephesian Christian community must consider worthy of double honor those pastors who work hard at teaching the Word of God. The fact that Paul addresses this issue of remuneration of elders implies that there was a problem in the Christian community in Ephesus with regards to their attitudes towards pastor teachers. Undoubtedly, this was, for those who studied the First Timothy with me, this was the direct result of the apostasy of many pastors in Ephesus, whom Paul discusses in First Timothy chapter 1, which we're going to discuss, Alexander and Hymenaeus in First Timothy chapter 1 with regards to the subject of uh, church discipline and the pastor. So pa- Paul and the church uh, at Ephesus disciplined these two men who were teaching the uh, the resurrection and, and the timing of the resurrection in era, which is quite interesting. So again, uh, the fact that Paul addresses this issue of remuneration of elders implies that there was a problem in the Christian community in Ephesus with regards to their attitudes towards their pastors. Undoubtedly, this again was the direct result of the apostasy of many pastors in Ephesus whom Paul discusses again in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Of course, 
there were Christians who adhered to this command by Paul in 1 Timothy 5.17, and there must have been some that did not. Otherwise, he would not have addressed, have addressed this issue in the first place. Thus, Paul is simply communicating a general precept of the Word of God and the Lord and the Apostles' teaching without reference to whether there was a violation of this command or not. Now, the word for honor there in 1 Timothy 5.17 is the noun time in the Greek. It means not only to honor in the sense of respect and valuing the role of the elders in teaching the, the Ephesian congregation the Word of God, but also it denotes remuneration for fulfilling this function on behalf of the body of Christ. So, in other words, the Ephesian church is not only to show respect for those elders who worked hard at teaching them the Word of God, but also they were, it was to uh, provide for them financially. In other words, this demonstrates how much they value what these elders did for them and their families. So, you sh in other words, you show your respect for your pastor by supporting him financially, whatever the Lord's leading you to do. It does say in Galatians 6, 6, that those who are taught the Word of God are share of good things with those who teach him. And there are many, you know, I also have to say this with the advent of the internet and um, there are many people who benefit from uh, the teaching of men that is provided on their websites for free uh, without any charge. And I'm one of those individuals and these people are benefiting from it and not reciprocating and helping the ministry financially. Even though you're benefiting from the man's teaching, you, you they're not supporting it financially and, and not giving anything. And I, I, I've, I've, you know, I've over the years uh, noticed this, that a small, tiny, of all the people, and I see all the hits and all the, I mean, we're in, like Academy EDU, I'm like, uh, we're in the top 1%. We got over, uh, over 2,500 followers and almost a million views since 2017, since I've been on there. But only a few have showed any reciprocation. And uh, in, in Western Bible Industries, it's even worse. And this small, tiny group is supporting the ministry financially. That's not right. Like I've said this before, if you were a plumber and you did work for somebody, do you expect to get paid? I mean, my my job, my 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 well financial well being is tied to the body of Christ and whether they're going to reciprocate or not. And a lot of people don't want you to talk about teaching uh, the, and talk about the money, but Jesus talked about money more than than, than any other subject. People. That's right. I got the numbers to show you in the Gospels. <laughs> so, because that's what he did. He talked about money and our attitude toward it. And uh, so he even talked about it in relation to the uh, this, uh, those who taught the Word of God in the church. He does that in Luke 10, uh, uh, Matthew 10, and uh, he talks about it in Luke 10, I think, as well. And so, which we'll touch upon at the, at the end here. But, you know, I'm trying to tell you, my job as a pastor to tell you your responsibility as a Christian. Okay, You might not like me talking about money, I don't really particularly like talking about money. I, I've got to the point in my life, I don't really care. But uh, I'm telling you, my job is to teach you the Word of God. And, and the Word of God teaches you, teaches the church about how the, what their attitude toward money should be and their responsibilities to it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, those who taught the Word of God, uh, Galatians 6, 6, those who taught the Word of God, I share all the good things with those who teach them. 1 Corinthians 9 uh, talks about the, the, those who proclaim the gospel should get their living from the gospel. And a lot of a lot of churches that treat their pastors terribly and show their disrespect for them, even though these guys are pumping out the word of God, they're not getting supported by their own congregations, and to the congregations are not really uh, going to get much rewards at the bema They're going to be considered bad stewards of the finances that God gave them when they don't support their pastors. It's the, it's especially pastors who got families and they're really struggling, and you know a lot of guys go by vocational and get a second job. And you have to do that. A lot of these guys have to do that. I mean, I've been fortunate where I was about to do something like that and a bunch of money would come in. So I, you know, I would ask deliberately, God, should I get a second job? And money would come in. And, uh, you know, I remember when I, when I moved to Massachusetts and it was really kind of hairy because I didn't have a congregation in front of me. And uh, I remember it was around a couple of weeks before Christmas, I was praying, God, you know, you want me to get, and I was, I really had a second job. I was taking care of my father and my mother. My mother has dementia. I was the one making the calls to her, you know, Jerry Sykes or the doctors and everything. It's a full-time job. It feels what Darren has, has dementia. And, she, and so, I have, I, I, as far as I was concerned, and then I was trying to keep Western Mild Ministries going after moving from Iowa to Massachusetts. And I'm living with my parents. 
So it was pretty tough. And so a couple of weeks before Christmas, I was praying, you know, if you want me to get a second job, open up the doors for me to get a second job. In fact, I, I even put a, my, my uh, resume out to the post office to get a job at the post office. And I was, I was like, any, I was like, I don't care. I was like, at this point I would had, I had been, fed, I was fed up with it. And I was like, so Lord, if you want me to get a second job and do by vocational, I'll have no problem. And that week I get a call and uh, somebody uh, uh, had, um, had uh, put me in their will, which they promised they would. I didn't realize they had passed away because I moved to Massachusetts and they, they left a bunch of money for Winston Bible Industries. They, they, they put me in their will. And uh, then uh, it was like five grand. And then, and then uh, that same week, I had three different people give me $1,000 and one wrote me a letter saying the Holy Spirit was really convicting them to send me something. And I was like, that's just right on the heels of asking God, should I go by vocational? So what would you do? Don't go by vocational. <laughs> God was like saying, I already gave you a second job helping your dad with your mom. <laughs> So it worked out. So, um, but you know, part of being a pastor, you're going to have is the angelic conflict. So uh, he's going to put pressure on you financially. Satan will, and God will permit it, for, because what God means for what Satan means for evil, God means for good, right? So it's actually for my my benefit that I've I've gone through trials and tribulations financially because of uh, being mistreated by members of the body of Christ financially, quite frankly, and they know some of these a lot of these people know about that. Yeah, and uh, so, and there are a lot of guys like me, they have it even a lot worse than I've ever had. So you take care of your past, especially those who work hard preaching, teaching the word of God and uh, pumping the word of God out, giving you the word of God. You should support them financially. And even if you have your first job, I mean, if you're following a guy, listening guys, benefiting guys, teaching like mine on the internet, your pastor comes first and then me, okay? But if you don't have another pastor and you're benefiting from me. You should be supporting me like you would if you were right there, uh, you know, in the guy's ministry. You are part of my ministry if, if um, you know, you're listening to me exclusively, you know. But um, anyways, that's very important. We remember this point here. So that, uh, you know, I'll repeat it again here. The word honor, time, it means not only to honor in the sense of respect and valuing the role of the elders and teaching the Ephesian congregation the word of God, but also it denotes remuneration for fulfilling this function on behalf of the body of Christ. The Ephesians uh, were not only to show respect for those pastors who worked hard at teaching them the word of God, but also to provide for them financially. This demonstrates, again, how much they value what these elders do for them and their families. And that the idea contains the sense of remuneration is clearly indicated by the quotations that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 5.18. They define us for us in the quotations in verse 18, what Paul means by honor and worthy of double honor. So in uh, 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 25.4, first of all, which says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he's threshing. This is followed by a, a quote from the Lord Jesus Christ himself that the laborer is worthy of his wages. And this statement from our Lord is recorded in Matthew 10.10 10 and Luke 10.7. And the word for double there duplice it speaks of both respect and remuneration with the former expressed by the latter so in other words a christian demonstrates respect for the pastor who works hard teaching them the word of god by reciprocating and paying him for his services by doing so he also demonstrates how much he values this work on his behalf by the pastor thus the idea of providing generously for the pastor who works hard teaching the word of god is not contained in this expression, which is supported by the quotations from the law and the Lord. And both do not refer to generous compensation for teaching the gospel, but rather that one should be compensated for doing so. So Paul, in 1 Timothy 5.18, cites two passages of Scripture to support his command in 1 Timothy 5.17. Again, the first is from the Old Testament, specifically from the Mosaic Law, namely Deuteronomy 25.4, as I pointed out to you, and the second is from the New Testament, specifically, as I also pointed out to you, Luke 10, 7, and it's also found in Matthew 10, 10. And the second quotation that Paul uses as support for his command in 1 Timothy 5, 17, again, is found in, in, in Luke 10, 7, and Matthew 10, 10. That's a, a typo there. So uh, 1 Timothy 5, 18 in my uh, translation goes as follows. It says, uh, actually, I'll read the two verses together. It, uh it's silly not to read them both together. But if you look at 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18 from my, of my translation on the board, it goes, those elders 
who are leading correctly must be considered worthy of double honor, specifically those who make it their habit of working hard with respect to the word. Yes, teaching the word of God. Because, verse 18, the scripture says, now the Old Testament first, Deuteronomy 25, 4, you must absolutely never muzzle an ox while it does at any time tread out the grain. Also, quoting Matthew 10, 10 and Luke 10, 7, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the worker is as an eternal spiritual truth, it's a spiritual axiom, worthy, namely, of his pay. So, verse 18 presents the basis for Paul's command in 1 Timothy 5, 17, which indicates that Paul is basing his command in 1 Timothy 5, 17 on the teaching of the Word of God. The first piece of Scripture that Paul uses to support his command is in verse 17, as again, Deuteronomy 25, 4, and the second is from the Lord, and, which is recorded in Luke 10, 7 and Matthew 10, 10, as we pointed out. And the former, the Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy 25, 4, teaches that one must not muzzle an ox while it's threshing out the grain. And the latter, again, is that a laborer is worthy of his wages. So therefore, Paul in 1 Timothy 5, 18 presents two reasons why elders who work hard teaching the word of God must be considered by the congregation as worthy of double honor, i.e. respect, which is demonstrated by remuneration for their services. So in Deuteronomy 25, 4, it says you must absolutely never muzzle an ox while it does at any time tread out the grain. That's my translation. Originally, this command in Deuteronomy 25, 4 was given out of concern for oxen, obviously, and uh, which were employed by the citizens of Israel. Now, the ox was driven over a threshing floor, and by doing so, would be able to separate the grain from the stalk and shaft with its hooves, and the animal was allowed to eat some of the grain. Now, if the farmer gains from the work of the ox, he should allow the animal to sustain itself. Now, in 1 Timothy 5.18, and also 1 Corinthians 9, 1-14, Paul uses this command in Deuteronomy 25.4 to teach that if the animal is allowed to sustain himself by the work it provides for the farmer, should not the pastor teacher sustain himself by the work they perform for their congregations? Again, and 1 Timothy 5.18 and 1 Corinthians 9, 1-14, where this command that Paul uh, lists in Deuteronomy 25.4, he uses this command in that passage in Deuteronomy. And so if you compare these three passages, in Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.18 and 1 Corinthians 9, 1-14, Paul's teaching from this command in Deuteronomy 25.4 is that if the animal was allowed in the Old Testament to sustain itself by the work it provided for the farmer, and treading out the grain, should not, or we could say how much more, should pastor teachers that are not animals but human beings sustain themselves and their families by the work they perform for their congregations. So uh, I, I'll say this, I know a pastor, and this congregation is going to lose their pastor if they don't wake up. Uh, there's, I know the congregation, and they have, they, there's, there's, they have the money to support this, this man and his, uh, and his wife, and uh, they're not doing their job. And a lot of them are talking about their their um, their va their uh, retirement and all that stuff and what they're going to do. And they got nice, a lot of them. I know the homes that many of them have and the, the nice homes. And yet this guy, you know, he's they don't, they're not paying him enough. And, he's, you know, a lot of times he doesn't even take a paycheck. And uh, and so there's another congregation uh, I know down south that uh, will be interested in him. So the, the, the church, this guy's a, a pastor over, they better wake up because they're going to lose him. Somebody's going to pick, pick him up and really show their, they really appreciate somebody like him where I don't think this guy's congregation is appreciating him and the work that he does. And, uh, and he's been, he's an expository type teacher. He's a great pastor, but his congregation is not supporting them the way they should. And there are other, there are other congregations out there to look for, kill for someone like him that is, is dedicated to teaching the Word of God three times a week as he does. And he's been doing it for years. So uh, they, better, they better wake up because they're going to lose him. And, uh, and, and, and the Lord, you know, uh, he's, he's going to, you know, I know this, this pastor. I said, just keep doing what you're doing. The Lord will, you know, take care of you. And he knows that. And, uh, but um, his congregation needs to wake up because they need to start supporting the guy 
and uh, they shouldn't be. There's no reason why they should be behind financially as they are, because I, I know what they got over. They got over there. They're not. They're not a bunch of poor people from uh, Ghana, <laughs> you know. So, they, but they're all. And, and a lot of them are just, you know, wor- spend money. I mean, they spend money on silly things. Many of these people. I, I, I've said this over the past. I know guys. That, you know, they, they got a lot of money. They spend. They have like three Harleys. You know how much a Harley costs? And they got three Harleys. How many Harleys do you need? And yet. They their pastor is driving in a, in a in a car that's got bald tires and he can't afford to get new tires because he doesn't make enough money to buy. I mean, and yet the guy teaches five times a week. You know, it's like I've seen that. You know, people live in mansions, literally mansions, that I've had in my congregation, and they're cheap son of a guns. They'll spend all kinds of money on themselves and build this re- enormous, ridiculous mansion that they it's just them and their wife and a puppy, a dog, and you got to be kidding me. And yet you can't, and yet as a pastor, I, I didn't even enough, make enough money to pay uh, Iowa State taxes. I was so poor. I was at poverty level there and I taught five times a week. And on Sunday nights, I would do a, a lesson for the class, uh, for the uh, the kids. Um, unbelievable, teenagers. It was like, and, you, you, and, and not mention I was doing the music too. <laughs> but that's, some people, they're just, they're cheap son of a guns. That's no way, they're cheap. And that's not good for them because God took care of me and it built up my character to go through that, something like that. And I'm glad I went through something like that because it builds your character. It learns you, it makes you focus on the Lord and not, and you have to learn to focus on the Lord. Otherwise you're going to get bitter and you're going to leave, a lot of guys leave the ministry. They're leaving the ministry in droves. And one of the reasons they're leaving is because they can't support themselves financially. I would say go by vocational, but some of these guys got families, they got young kids, they got to put them through school, they got to put their kids through college too and you know, the, you know, everybody thinks that, you know, somebody else will take care of the guy. Well, you know, you're going to lose a guy like that. And a lot of ministries are losing good men because they're not supporting their men. And that's not all the reasons why they're leaving. Some of the reasons are, are the pastors themselves not living the spiritual life the way they should, not praying and not doing their jobs and, you know, or misconduct, you know, of some sort. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, he also quotes from this passage in Deuteronomy 25, 4 about the ox in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 14, Paul teaches the Corinthian church in this passage that they're to support pastor teachers financially by employing the figure of a fortiori and applying the reasoning from this command in the Mosaic law concerning provision for oxen to the pastor teachers who taught them the word of God. If God is concerned about oxen, then the arg- argument of a fortiori, the greater to the lesser, teaches how much more is he God concerned about those men who served the church, his church, by teaching them the word of God. So Paul brings out the ethical implications of Deuteronomy 25.4 for the Corinthians. If God uh, wants to oxen to partake of grain that they thresh, how much more should pastor teachers benefit materially and financially from those they serve by teaching them the word of God? So this quotation is an emphatic prohibition and it refers to fastening a strap or metal piece over the mouth of an animal to keep it from eating the grain that was being threshed. The muzzle was forbidden because it was cruel and inhumane to walk an ox over the grain all day and never allow him to satisfy his own hunger. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 1-14 applies this word, uh, this particular muzzling the ox, to those who work hard teaching the word of God. He teaches that just as God forbids the Israelites from muzzling their oxen when the animal was threshing out the grain. So the Christian community should not do the same by not paying their pastors for their services of teaching them the word of God. As it was cruel to muzzle the ox, it was equally cruel for the Christian community to not provide for their pastors, teachers, financial and material needs. Look at 1 Corinthians. This will be our last passage. Look at 1 Corinthians 9.1. And then we'll go to the Lord's Supper. So it says in 1 Corinthians 9.1, I'm reading from the Net Bible. Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? He's defending his apostleship, which was attacked by the Corinthian Christian community. They're attacking his authority. If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you. For you are the confirming sign of my apostleship in the Lord. He evangelized them. This is my defense to those who examine me. Do we not have the right to financial support? Rhetorical question, yes. Do we, have, do we not have the right to the company of a believing wife? Yes. Like the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas, that's Peter, 
or do not only Barnabas and I lack the right not to work? Whoever serves in the army at his own expense, no one does. This country, their country supports them. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit? Who tends a flock and does not consume its milk? Am I saying these things only on the basis of common sense or does not the law, the Mosaic law, say this as well? Then he quotes Deuteronomy 25, 4 as he does in 1 Timothy 5, 18. For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. God is not concerned here about oxen, is he? Or is he not only speaking for our benefit, the communicators of the word of God? It was for us, he says. It was written for us because the one plowing and threshing ought to work in hope of enjoying the harvest. If we sowed spiritual blessings among you, the teaching of the word of God, is it too much to reap material things from you? No, it's not asking too much. If others receive this right from you, are we not more deserving? Because he led them to the Lord. He discipled them. But we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we may not be a hindrance to the gospel of Christ, meaning he didn't make money at issue in this instance. Now, he's a church planter, but Paul gives directions, as we read in 1 Timothy 5, 17-18, that the pastors in these churches that he founded and planted should get remuneration for their services. He didn't take that right, though, Paul, because he was a church planter. And he didn't take that right of getting money from the people he evangelized because he didn't want anybody saying that he did it to uh, for the money. He was trying to basically um, uh, not have anything, like he says, hinder the gospel. So he, did, so he, and he didn't take it, even though he had the right to, to take remuneration and offering from the Corinthians, he didn't because he didn't want that to hinder people hearing the gospel uh, taught to them so they would get saved. So, But he did give directions to the pastors and the churches that they should get remuneration, though he didn't uh, take that right. He did accept money from the Philippians. We can see that from Philippians, the book of Philippians, but he didn't do that from the Corinthians. He didn't want anybody, uh, money to hinder the, the, the communication of the gospel. That's the main reason why I don't charge from any of my teaching. I've had people say, oh, you should. And, you should. and that's why I don't go to a publisher and get my bo books published, which are book ready, and make a I can make a ton of money doing that. I don't do that because I don't want money uh, you know, twenty-five dollars to get my book hinder somebody from getting the word of God. The great thing about the internet, I can put it out there and don't have to charge anybody for anything. And so, therefore, money is not gonna. You can never say that money was an obstacle in Bill Wenstrom's ministry. It and but it is other guys like me, Jim Ricard, uh, Bob Theme was like that. A lot of people were like that uh, that are out there that were disciples of his. They don't charge for their their, their teaching. And, uh, but that doesn't mean, I know we're supposed to get, we have a right to make a living from the gospel, but I don't see in the Bible where it says that uh, the apostles and Jesus and uh, the prophets of Israel tried, put it said 99, 9.95 for my teaching in, in a book form. They didn't do that, did they? So I don't see I have any right to put a price on anything. To me, that's like peddling the word of God. And a lot of people would disagree with me, but uh, did Jesus and the apostles charge for their teaching? Show me that. So, for, so when you go to when you charge for a book, you're charging for the, the word of God. It's wrong. But I know people have been doing it for, since the publishing houses and the printing press. But that doesn't mean they're right. You know, for, two, for for way before the printing press, pastors never charged for their teaching unless they're in apostasy. I'm not saying you're in apostasy because you 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 sold your book. But uh, think about it. Just think about what I'm saying. So then it says in verse 13, don't you know that those who serve in the temple eat food from the temple and those who serve at the altar receive a part of the offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded those who proclaim the gospel to receive their living by the gospel. There you go. So uh, as we finish off uh, this lesson, if you look on the board and finish off this lesson, we see that, uh, that uh, not only does 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18 teach that the Christian community is to support financially those pastors who are teaching them the word of God and uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 14. But the rest of the New Testament does as well. Uh, it's, it says in Galatians 6, 6, those who, the one who has taught the word is to share all good things with those who teach him. Uh, and uh, in, in Matthew 10, 1 through 10, and Luke 10, 1 through 7, when he sent the apostles out to proclaim the gospel throughout Israel, uh, he, he said that they should get uh, remuneration for their services. Look at, we'll look at this last passage in close. 
and go to the Lord's Supper. Look at Luke 10.1. Luke 10, 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs surrounded by wolves. Do not carry a money bag, a traveler's bag, or sandals and greet no one on the road. Whenever you enter a house, first say, Peace, may peace be on this house. And if a peace loving person is there, your peace will remain on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that same house, eating and drinking what they give you. Then he says, For the worker, Paul quotes this in 1 Timothy 5 18, for the worker deserves his pay. Do not move around from house to house. Whenever you enter a town, the people welcome you. Eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in that town and say to them, the kingdom of God has come upon you. But whenever you enter a town and the people do not welcome you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to your feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, the kingdom of God has come. Well, let's now go into, uh, segue into the Lord's Supper. I have bread and juice in front of me and uh, we'll observe the communion elements, observe the Lord's table. And uh, what I'll do is, I'll, as I usually do, is I'll sing us a song and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll go into observing the communion elements. So let me put my, uh, get, get my set up for my uh, guitar so I can sing you this song that's in honor of the Lord and uh, written especially for the Lord's Supper. So I'll, I'll put the, uh, my mic on mute and I'll be right back with you. Alrighty, I'm back. It's called uh, A Love Song to My Savior. Oh, my 
Savior Nothing can tear us apart Oh, I'm in love with you, Jesus Oh, wiping my sins Yes, I'm so in love with you, Jesus. I think of you all night and day. Yes, I'm so in love with you, Jesus. For wiping my sins. Yes, I'm so in love with you, Jesus. I think of you all night and day. Yes, I think of you all night and day. Yes, I think of you all. Day. All right, let me hang the guitar up. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. And uh, if you could, go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 14. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 14. And we're going to, as I said before, um, observe the communion elements. So I have bread and juice in front of me. And um, so uh, we're going to be bringing to remembrance the personal work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you should be at Luke, chapter 24, verse uh, 22, verse 14. And uh, when we come into the communion uh, service and we observe the Lord's table, the bread and the juice represent Jesus Christ, his, per his person and his finished work on the cross. The bread speaks of his impeccable person as the God-man and uh, the cup. Uh, it speaks of his experiencing the wrath of God on the cross for every member of the human race. Uh, when he was abandoned by the Father and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was suffering uh, that the wrath of God there by being abandoned by the Father, losing fellowship with his Father those last three hours on the cross, and also through the scourgings he had two, the crucifixion and the physical torture, the physical the the verbal abuse he took at the cross, the physical torture he received. That's all part of him experiencing the wrath of God as a sinless person, the God Man, on our behalf, so that we wouldn't suffer the wrath of God forever in the lake of fire. So he was abandoned and will never be abandoned because the Father already abandoned his son for us. And when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, uh, we're appropriating the, the work that Christ did on the cross and reconciling us to a holy God. So Jesus is the God-man. The bread speaks of his impeccable person. He's without sin. Uh, he, there, no possibility for him, him ever sinning just because he's human being. That doesn't mean now he had the potential of sin. Uh, people are misunderstanding that. He's God in the flesh. The temptations that Christ went under, underwent with the devil, 
uh, was to demonstrate that he was who he was, as to claim to be the son of God. And the devil tempted him because he could, he was allowed to, but also the temptation merely demonstrated that he was who he claimed to be. So in other words, um, there was no chance of, just because the devil was uh, given the, allowed by God to tempt Jesus, doesn't mean that Jesus could have sinned. One, again, Satan was allowed to do that, so he took the opportunity. But Satan knew he was God. Now, can God sin? Just because God the Son became a human, human being, that didn't mean now he had the potential to sin. Because if he did, then the hypostatic union is, is a little messed up there. He's, not, he's no longer God anymore. You can tempt God to sin, but that doesn't mean he's going to sin. So it's like, can a tugboat attack a battleship? Yeah, but can it win? No. So, that, you know, it's just common sense. Jesus is God. So the, the nature of the temptations is what people misunderstand. Uh, the temptations were definitely, definitely to show that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Remember, they, the Jews were looking for signs that Jesus was, uh, who, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that person is a Messiah. So Jesus provided those signs. And one of those things he did was that he never sinned. That is in itself should tell you something. They should have known, recognized him as the Messiah because he never sinned. And of course, they didn't know their Bibles the way they should because then they thought that he was breaking the law by healing on the Sabbath <laughs> when he's the Lord of the Sabbath. So, the, so the, the, when we look at the cup and the bread. The bread speaks of his impeccable person. Jesus is undiminished deity and true sinless humanity in one person forever. Just because he was a human being, that didn't mean he, could, he acquired the potential to sin. Because he, he, then you, if he did, then the hypostatic union has been disrupted. The hypostatic union mean the divine the divine nature of Christ, which he had before before he became a human being. He's eternal Son of God, right? Equal to the Father, Son, equal to the Son and the uh, the Father and the Spirit has the same attributes as them. He's eternal person. He's always existed. He pre-existed before becoming a human being. Before Abraham was, I am, right? So, just because he became a human being, that doesn't mean now he had the potential to sin because he became a human being. And don't tell me that Satan needed to have the potential for Jesus to sin to have a fair trial. That's ridiculous. If God condemned, if God executed Satan's uh, sentence to go to the lake of fire, Matthew 25, 41, and did it immediately, he would have been just to do that. God was giving Satan grace by giving him an appeal trial, which is human history. So, Jesus, when he suffered the wrath of God on the cross, which I described to you when he was abandoned by the Father, he, he, the Trinity was not disrupted, and nor was the hypostatic union. It was the fellowship between the Father and the Spirit. Now, he offered himself up to the eternal Spirit, Hebrews 9.14. So, when he suffered the wrath of God in our place, he did that so we wouldn't suffer the wrath of God in the lake of fire forever. So, those sinners who believe in Jesus as their Savior, they appropriate that deliverance from the wrath of God. Also deliverance from sin and Satan, physical and spiritual death, personal sins, condemnation from the law, enslavement to sin and Satan in this cosmic system. And not to mention the eternal condemnation we're delivered from. So, uh, we're bringing into remembrance what he did for us. So Christ redeemed us out of the slave market of sin, and he reconciled us sinners to a holy God, and he propitiated the Father's holiness, which demanded that sin and sinners be judged. So in a way, our point of contact with God is His justice and righteousness because of the doctrine of justification. At the moment, a sinner trusts in Jesus as Savior. The Father imputes His Son's righteousness, credits His Son's righteousness to the sinner who's trusted in His Son, and He sees that righteousness and declares us justified. That's the whole point of Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And so, the justice and righteousness of God declare us justified. So there's our point of contact with God. And then as a result, we benefit from the love of God that's been poured out on us as a result of our justification through faith in Jesus. So we're bringing into remembrance this great act of love of our Lord, bringing into remembrance what He did for us in His person and work. So if you look on the board, it says in Luke 22:14. Now when the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles joined him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among you, among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, 
I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he says in verse 19, then he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, and gave it to them saying, this is my body, not his literal body. This is not transubstantiation, which is erroneously taught by the Catholic church. He's using figurative language. Eat my body, drink my blood. Uh, John 6, what is this? It's John chapter 6. And he's clearly talking in figurative terms. And they thought he was talking about cannibalism. And the passage makes clear that he's, he's talking about faith in him. So he says, this is my body. This represents my body, he says, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's a command. So let us partake of the bread in remembrance of our Lord's perfect, impeccable person. And then it says in verse 20, and in the same way, the Lord took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So let us partake of the cup in remembrance of our Lord's death. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you, Father, for uh, this great sacrifice that your son performed for us at Calvary 2,000 years ago, the sacrifice you made in sacrificing your son, making him experience your wrath on the cross so that we would experience the wrath of God forever in the lake of fire. I thank you so much, Father, for that. I pray that this bring in remembrance, the personal work of your son and this great act of love would motivate us to greater obedience in your word and the body of Christ and taking serious our relationship with you always uh, uh, keeping short accounts with you by confessing our sins and, and making obedience to your word a priority and in our lives. And thank you for those who are. Help us to continue to persevere, those who are being faithful. For those who might not be faithful at this point, I just pray, Father, you tell them that they, you've given them grace and that you want them, you give them grace so not so they can continue living in sin, but that they can repent and confess their sins and be serious with you in their relationship with you and follow your son, Jesus Christ, taking up their cross daily as your son commanded us to. And so I just pray, Father, those who are struggling in their walk with God over the years, last several years, that they would, uh, that they would uh, repent by confessing their sin and, and then making a priority of, of taking in the word of God every day, being a good steward, the time, talent, and treasure and truth that you've given them, uh, submitting to the authority of the past, the teacher that you've given to them, that assigned them to, so I just pray, Father, for this series also, and today's lesson on the pastor teaching financial support of him. I pray it would be a great blessing to the body of Christ now, this lesson, this live broadcast, and also through the recordings at a later date. So I pray for this uh, service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. We'll pick this up Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time as we continue our study of the Doctrine of Past the Teacher. And if you're in the Huntsville, Alabama area, at, we're at 1215 Russell Street, Northeast in Huntsville, Alabama, Doctrine of Bible Church. I'll be teaching on the Book of Obadiah uh, tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, so hopefully, if you're in the area, you can join us. So let's close in. Uh, th thank you. I've already closed in prayer, so we'll see you Tuesday. <laughs> see you.